Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming back. It's Sunday the 26th of April and welcome to this global update. Now, I've just sketched out a bit of an infographic here because I quite like infographics to show the way out of this. Now, here we have this wretched coronavirus in the middle here. So that's 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 the coronavirus in the middle that we need to attack. Now, how do we do that? Well, at the moment, we've got this rather crude lockdown strategy that's that's not really very discriminatory, but it will bear down on the virus and it will attack the virus. So that's good. But what we need much more of and what I want to focus on partly in this video as well today is we need much more specific testing. So whereas the lockdown measure is just one blunt device for everyone, the testing is thousands of little specific attacks based on uh, everyone that's tested. And this is the test for the antigen. So this is the swab that you take a throat swab with for the antigen testing to tell people if they have the virus. So that's important as well. Now, the other form of testing that's important is the, uh, the testing for the antibodies. Now, the hope is with this test, we'll have a test and you just put a drop of blood on there and you'll get the marks on here that tells you whether you're positive or negative, just like a pregnancy test. So we're hoping that we're going to get these really cheaply and really abundantly soon. And this will tell us who has had the virus. And someone will become antibody positive just in the few days after symptoms develop in most cases. So once the antigen test was positive, the antibody test would be positive shortly after that. And I would expect the antibody test to remain positive for a year or 18 months, although we're not definitive about that yet. So they're more precise ways of attacking the virus. Now, the other one that we're hopeful for is therapeutics. So medicines. So if it was that you could get this infection and just take a couple of pills and it would go away, that would be pretty wonderful. Again, problem over. So therapeutics are aware of attacking the virus. As of now, we don't have them or proven efficacy, unfortunately. Now, the other thing we're using at the moment, of course, is social distancing. The fact that there's a minimum of two meters and preferably more inside between individuals to break the chain of transmission of the virus. Now we're going to have to maintain this for the next, until we get a vaccine, this is going to have to be maintained for the foreseeable future. But as well as that, more people will start to become immune who've had it. And this is this concept of herd immunity. Now this is the correct epidemiological term. We do use herd immunity. So if this person here is exposed to the virus, that person there is exposed to the virus, and they come into contact with that person next door who's immune, they won't get it. So they won't colonize, recolonize the virus in their respiratory tract, we believe. Most people believe this for most of the time anyway. And that means the virus can't be passed on to this next person here. So that next person is protected by the immune people in society. This is this concept of herd immunity. But of course, the absolute big cure, the big end of this pandemic is not going to come till we have a vaccine. And these are being worked on at the moment. I would hope the vaccines are going to be with us early 2021, but it could be mid 2021. We really don't know. And the vaccine is going to be the big bazooka that actually clobbers this virus and gets rid of it from the face of the earth, we hope. We hope to eliminate it altogether. I really hope it doesn't become uh, endemic. And as well as that, of course, that the vaccine will also generate more herd immunity. So once we've got 70, 80 percent of people in the world immune to this virus, then the problem should go away. And I'm hopeful the virus will be eradicated. So that's just a sort of a, a bit of background, really, on, on what we're working on. This is what we're trying to achieve, the eradication of this virus. And these are the strategies that we have at our uh, at our disposal. Now, I think what I'll do now, I've got a few things to do this morning. I think what we'll do next is we'll look at, um, one of the things I wanted to do today was look at health inequalities as, as, well as, um, as well as testing. I might do this as two separate videos. We'll see how we go. So um, I don't want that one yet. That's testing for later on. Yes, yeah, what we want. So what we're looking at, what I want to look at today is, is aspects of health inequality because the, the, the inequalities of health around the world are absolutely 
huge and this is a problem that well I've been interested in and looking at for, for decades really. Um, just a few examples. Um, now ventilators probably aren't the way to go very often in this infection. We, we know there's other treatment approaches but just to use ventilators as kind of a proxy. Now Italy had 80, ventil 80 ventil ventilators per million people. But it's not just the ventilators, it's all the stuff that goes with it, all the healthcare facility that goes with it. Italy has an advanced healthcare system. But if we're using ventilators as a guide, Kenya's got one ventilator per two million people. 0.5 per million people. So it's a big, big difference. Nigeria, it's 0.8. Now, India, it's 11, which doesn't sound too bad, but it's 11 per million people. But having been in, involved in some healthcare in India, the inequalities in healthcare in India are just huge, massive. <clears throat> There's all sorts of problems in healthcare in India, um, not the least of which are, are financial inequalities and uh, lots of things that we could talk about. But just suffice it to say there is huge problems with healthcare in India and with inequalities in healthcare. Many poorer people struggle to get healthcare at the best of times. Now, doctors per million, the UK is about 28. Democratic Republic of Congo is less than one and Afghanistan is less than three. So again, there's there's websites with all these on. You can look at the, look them up, but there's great inequalities again in the amount of medical expertise available to people. And then simple healthcare uh, preventative strategies like, like Nigeria. Four out of 10 people in uh, Nigeria, I believe, have running water. In other words, uh, six out of 10 don't have access to running water. So it gets a bit tricky washing your hands without running water. So these, <clears throat> these infrastructural problems um, just, just mean there's huge challenges in many poorer parts of the world. So uh, I, I've done a hand washing video. I just go to my house, I turn the tap on and I wash my hands anytime uh, I think I need to. But in Nigeria and, and indeed many, many other countries in the world, that's just not possible for many, many people. That means we need hand sanitizers and lots of other approaches, but it just shows the the the, uh, the the challenges that are going to greatly ex ex exacerbate the severity of this pandemic. Now, um, yesterday I gave you some comorbidities related to heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure, hypertension, and of course these are th th these are all factors. We know this. Um, the comorbidities make severity of the disease more likely. And I'm, I'm actually going to bring a paper shortly or as soon as I get time that's looking at that in, in more details that was carried on in, in the States. But we know it's true from quite a bit of data. What we don't know about comorbidities, for which there's no data at the moment, is what are the effects of malnutrition? Now, we can. I think I'm in a position to pretty well guarantee that malnutrition is going to reduce immune... Well, we do know for a simple fact that malnutrition will reduce redu immune function therefore will um, reduce immunity to COVID-19. I think that's pretty well guaranteed. And it's not so much sometimes blatant malnutrition where people appear to be starving, but just lack of particular nutrients or lack of particular amino acids or proteins or lack of vitamins or minerals that can make a big difference to, <coughs> make a big difference to immune function. Now, Tuberculosis is just endemic in many parts of the world, in Africa, in Asia. It's everywhere and often not well treated or badly treated. Um, Russia has a lot of tuberculosis. And there's also what we call MDR-TB, multiple drug resistant tuberculosis. Really, we have a pandemic of tuberculosis already. <clears throat> now, what I don't know is how COVID-19 infection is going to manifest itself in someone who already has tuberculosis. I'm pretty sure it's going to make the prognosis a lot worse. HIV. Kenya, for example, about 6% of the population is HIV positive. So I'm pretty sure that when someone gets COVID-19 and they have HIV, it's going to make the COVID-19 worse. So to what degree will these things increase case fatality rate? Will it double it? Will it triple it? We simply don't know at the moment, but it's not going to be good. Malaria, again, totally endemic in many parts of Asia and Africa. So if someone has malaria and they get COVID-19, 
How is that going to affect the individual? I don't think it's going to be good. Dengue, vi- viral insect-borne disease, um, very common in, in uh, Asia. Again, if someone's got dengue, how is that going to affect it? And many parasitic diseases, of course, gastrointestinal parasites all over the world, um, other, other parasitic diseases. So how are all these very common comorbidities throughout the world going to manifest <clears throat> once COVID-19 comes along as a co-infection when they have TB and COVID-19, HIV and COVID-19, malaria and COVID-19. I don't think anyone knows yet, but I strongly suspect it's going to significantly increase the case fatality rate. Now, of course, we have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and lung diseases, high blood pressure, heart disease. These, these are Western conditions, and we know all of these reduce the likelihood of um, recovery if someone is severely ill from COVID-19 and we know all of these make uh, COVID-19 worse. We know these are exacerbating factors already. But lung disease is actually remarkably common in poorer countries. I remember I did some teaching once in Nepal and I arrived there and I was amazed how much chronic bronchitis there was in people. A lot of coughing and spitting and phlegm and things like that. Because you'd think it would be all the Himalayas and nice fresh mountain air. But the point is, many poor people, and it's cold for quite a lot of the year there, many poor people live in houses without cooking facilities. So this means they have to cook on wood fires indoors. So it means that children are exposed to wood smoke virtually from the time they're born. It's an appalling situation. And there's a lot of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease from cooking fires all around the world. And that's the same in many, many poor areas because they cook on open fires and breathe in the fumes. Again, high blood pressure is is a hypertension is a disease of the West, but it's increasingly common everywhere now in the world, as is heart disease. And of course, the effects of crowding are, are, are going to be uh, going to be significant, of course, because people are simply closer together in small houses. Now, I could have picked any of these diseases to uh, to focus on today, but what I've done is I've picked um, diabetes because this is another pandemic. So we know that people who already have diabetes are more at risk of severe disease if they contract COVID-19. And we know they are at greater risk of dying if they contract COVID-19. So just what is the problem of diabetes around the world? Well, the number of people with diabetes has risen from 108 million in 1980 to 422 million in 2014. That's World Health Organization data now. So I think we'd be pretty safe in saying now we've got half a billion or more people with diabetes in the world. It's huge. And all these people are going to be increased risk. The global prevalence, that's how many cases there are in the population, of diabetes among adults over 18 years of age has risen from 4.7% in 1980 to 8.5%. So now we're about 9, over 9%. This is is the World Health Organization data set. This is the last reliable data, but um, fair to say there's over 9% of the world's population are now diabetic. Let me put that another way in the context of this pandemic. 9% of the world's population are at greater chance of getting more severe disease if they contract COVID-19. And 9% of the world's population are at greater chances of dying if they contract COVID-19. And this is just diabetes we're taking as an example for the burden of global uh, morbidity. Diabetes prevalence has been rising more rapidly and in middle and uh, low income countries. So we often think of diabetes, type 2 mostly diabetes we're talking about here. Type 1 is the type of diabetes you get when you're young. It's the insulin dependent type. Although type 2, of course, does become insulin dependent. And we often think of it as being related to inactivity and obesity, but it's not always the case. Uh, It's becoming more common in middle and low income countries now. So this is a disease of the West and a disease of the, the global South as well. Diabetes is a major cause of blindness, kidney failure, heart attack, stroke and lower limb amputations. Now, <clears throat> diabetes is one of these iceberg conditions. Very often people have it and they don't know they have it. So we often pick up people in Western countries who've been diabetic maybe for a year or two and didn't know they had it. But um, a few years ago, I was doing some work in Phnom Penh in, in Cambodia. And 
people would present with diabetes with uh, limb, li limb necrosis. Literally, their toes would go black. They would present with renal failure. They would present with blindness. In other words, they had this disease and they didn't know they had it until they developed a major complication. So again, these complications of diabetes, presumably, are going to make COVID-19 infection worse. In 2016, an estimated 1.6 million deaths were directly caused by diabetes. Another 2 million deaths were attributed to high blood glucose levels in 2012. Now, if we're doing this video in a few years' time, um, what are we going to say about the number of people that died of COVID-19 in uh, 2020 to 2021 as a result of having poorly managed diabetes? It's, it's, a, it's an open question and it's an interesting question, but we really need to try and get a grip on these diseases because we can manage diabetes very well. Now, as I say, that's just one example. We could have looked at many diseases um, that, that illustrate this point of global uh, global inequality. So the global inequalities in healthcare are going to mean more people severely ill, I believe, in, in many poorer countries. Uh, those that do get put very ill are going to have much less access to effective medical care than in Italy, for example, or the UK, for example. And that means that many more of these are, are going to die. And that means that the case fatality rate is going to be increased. So what do we do about this? Well, we have to take measures to try and make healthcare provision available to everyone. We have to try and take measures to ensure that people at risk are educated and helped with as many resources as possible. Things like simply improving the quality of nutrition um, could be, uh, a, a, will be a massive benefit. I mean, we're so thankful in, in so far in China and uh, Europe, for example, that the death rate in children has been so low. But when we are dealing with children who are significantly malnourished, what difference is that going to make? Well, the malnutrition is going to reduce the efficiency of the immune system. We know this. And that could well mean that we end up with a high case fatality rate in many poorer parts of the world amongst children, which would be an absolute catastrophe. So we can reduce that risk now by ensuring good malnutrition for, for children everywhere. Now, I'm not quite sure how we do this, but this is, this is the answer to these questions. As well as making sure that things like... Um, vaccines are distrib distributed when they come but they're not here yet therapeutics aren't here yet they're going to need to be distributed um, but just doing things that can improve the quality of people's health generally and improve people's education generally which hopefully is what we're trying to do now is going to massively reduce the case fatality rate of this pandemic and that means we can kind of choose how many people are going to die we can choose that many less people die if that is a choice that we want to make